Amen. Well, God said, Amen. 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 Praise God. We're looking at Acts 17, verses 16 through 34. If you noticed in your notes, you can take your notes. The whole text is on the front page and on the back page. We are just reading uh, in the beginning here, verses 16 through 21. This is the living and inerrant word of God. Now, while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him when he saw that the city was given over to idols. Therefore, he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with the Gentile worshipers and in the marketplace daily with those who happened to be there. Then certain Epicurean and Stoic philosophers encountered him And some said, what does this babbler want to say? Others said, he seems to be a proclaimer of foreign gods, because he preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, may we know what this new doctrine is of which you speak, for you are bringing some strange things to our ears. Therefore, we want to know what these things mean. For all the Athenians... And the foreigners who were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. Father in heaven, we are here to hear your precious and living word, which is inerrant, which is eternal. Lord, guide us, we pray. Open our minds to understand this passage. May we be doers, not just good hearers, faithful hearers. And Father, we thank you for the word of God and that we have it as a treasure to speak. And so we praise you for this time to look into this passage and Paul's evangelism in Athens. We commit our hearts to you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Well, Phil and I and uh, Michael uh, Elliott and Bill Curley and John Mays, we have met uh, in person and uh, through email several times to uh, think about, we've met recently to think about and to plan and to pray about ways to help us all uh, to grow in carrying out this commission that we were given, that we saw two weeks ago, we heard. And one aspect of that, of course, is evangelism. To carry out the commission, we must be evangelists of making the good news, in other words, of Jesus known to the people that the Lord has put us around. So I thought it would be good for us to look at Paul's evangelism here in Athens. It's very fun to meditate on this passage, and uh, there's much more that could be said than I will be saying this morning, so I could encourage you to pray through that and meditate through it. So just to let you know, though, that uh, just the verse before Uh, Verse 16 tells us that Paul was uh, brought here uh, after escaping, essentially, from Berea. They kind of shuttled him off there and left uh, Silas and Timothy, remained in Berea, and then uh, he was expecting them to come. He wanted them to come and meet him in in Athens, and he said to send them as soon as possible. And then in verse 16, it says, Now while Paul, the Apostle Luke who wrote this, Now while Paul waited for them at Athens, so he's waiting, But he wasn't idle, I-D-L-E, he wasn't idle. His spirit was provoked within him when he saw that the city was given over to idols. You couldn't help but see that in in Athens at that time. So Paul was waiting for Timothy and Silas. This was his second missionary journey. But while waiting there, he observed. He was very observant. He didn't just sit around waiting for them. He observed. And uh, what he saw and what he heard grieved him greatly, I believe. He was greatly distressed by all these idols that he saw. And there was a philosopher in Athens uh, back in those days who said that it was easier to find a god than a man in Athens. And uh, to let you know why, it was estimated that there were over 30,000 idols. And the estimated population of that time uh, of Athens was 10,000. So indeed, that was true. And so Paul looked around. He was really distressed. How could you not be distressed? He's moved. He's greatly troubled by all that he saw. He's provoked. Uh, Maybe he had a righteous anger in this. 
And he wanted to cry out against this evil idolatry. He couldn't just sit there. This is the Apostle Paul. He wouldn't have done that. And he wanted to proclaim the glory of God. And he saw, so he saw all these people, all these people stumbling around, walking in darkness. They didn't think so. All these people enslaved to sin and captive to Satan. And, and it stirred him up to speak. And dear people, I am praying, we are praying that we here would be stirred up to speak. There's a pastor named Ray Stedman. I think back in the 70s, he was uh, serving in California, and he had students from Stanford University, I think, at his, at his church. And this is a quote that he had that I thought was relevant. He said, um, these are Christian students at Stanford University some years ago, and this is in their student newspaper. So they put this in there. I think they were stirred up. They said, why are we Christians willing to follow Jesus into suffering in order to accomplish his mission of liberation? Because Jesus has changed our minds about a lot of things, and we can no longer tolerate the foolishness and the futility that is passed out as wisdom at this university. We had some guts. We are tired. Would they even be allowed to put that these days? I don't know. We are tired of the, quote, enlightenment of this age, which is blindly ignorant of its intellectual slavery to materialism and its contradictory obligation to ethical relativism. Not much has changed. We are tired of seeing people's lives wasted and unfulfilled because of their submission to the established world order. I mean, I think they meant the university worldview, any, almost any university worldview. They're tired of seeing people's lives wasted, they said. And I believe it would help us to be prepared. A lot of what I'm talking about today is us being prepared, us being ready. We, we would be prepared, better prepared, if we asked ourselves or thought uh, very often, well, what are the idolatries of our society? Maybe it's obvious to us here. Maybe I think we need to think about that some. And even of the people we speak with, what are they slave to. Certainly ethical relativism is rampant. There are no absolutes, whatever you want truth to mean. And also, for example, I just picked two, there are many, but statism. Statism seems to be like an addiction in our culture right now. You know, some think that government is their only stability. There's no security outside of the government. We must do what they say. It is an idol that has grown in our country that I have seen it grow in my lifetime, especially these past two years, and it leads to tyranny. And then science, you know, science that's thrown out a lot lately. It depends on who you ask, apparently. So science, your so-called, is now an idol, I believe. Many trust what others call science and what some experts say is science. Some experts say, I am the one who knows what science means. And we're supposed to believe them. For example, climate alarmists, Okay, they would claim to be scientists. They say that if you don't believe in them, you do not know science. You don't know what that means. When many of them really, I, frankly, I just are believe emotionally led. And there are many climate scientists that disagree with them. Very good ones. Very sharp ones. If they are allowed to disagree. That's why I like Cornwall Alliance for the Stewardship of Creation. If you need something to help you understand that idol, I would recommend reading that. It's the one of the few that I I read thoroughly. And so we must declare the gospel as the only way out of idolatry. It's all around us. We must be continually guarding ourselves from the idolatry that is all around us by the gospel. That is our only hope in that and anyone's only hope, which is in all the word of God. Now, there are many other isms we could talk about here. Don't have time for that. But I think it's good to ask yourselves, how can I be aware? Am I aware of the prevailing idolatry of our land. You know, the one simple way is like the, the worldview in five minutes. You know, that alerts you every day and you look at it and you think, really, people believe that? People are idolatry, you know, that's their idolatry. Well, Luke wrote in verse 17 then, he said, therefore, Paul reasoned in the synagogues with the Jews and with the Gentile worshipers and in the marketplace daily with those who happened to be there. So he reasoned with them, it says. So Paul began in Athens speaking in the synagogue, which he would normally do when he went into a new area. 
he would speak in the synagogue to, to the Jews, uh, who were uh, probably not idolaters. They did not have a, a, a worldview that way, as the Greeks did. Uh, but likely they were not following Jesus. And so he reasoned with them <clears throat> and with the Greeks or the Gentiles who had left idolatry, at least the Greek kind, and they, who were converted. They were proselytes to Judaism. So he reasoned with them. He, he knew how to speak with them. He could speak their language very well. And he explained and maybe disputed with them uh, from the scriptures, proving that Jesus was the Messiah. So that's what he did first when he went to Athens. And then he spoke, it says, daily in the marketplace or the agora. Uh, that was the commercial district. And it was very, uh, there were a lot of people there. And he, it says he spoke with those who happened to be there. It'd be kind of like going to the old market and just start walking around and those are the people that are there when the Lord brought you there. And so he, he hung out there. And he trusted God to lead him as he walked around in that crowd of people. And then thirdly, he spoke to the philosophers and he spoke to the judges uh, on Mars Hill. And Mars Hill was, uh, Athens was a civic center and Mars Hill was a place of judgment and they would sit there and make uh, judicial, uh, you know, it's a judicial uh, place. And he was ready, I think. Again, key word of this sermon, I, ready. He was ready to reach out to these three distinct groups in Athens. He was always ready, according to 1 Peter 3.15. And we're to always be ready. We're always to be prepared. And then in verse 18, it says, certain Epicurean and Stoic philosophers encountered him. I encountered him. I kind of would love to see that. Maybe I'll talk with Paul someday. What was that like? But the Epicureans came up, and they followed the philosophies of Epicurus, and they were materialists wholehearted materialists. And they focused on this life. They didn't believe in a life after, life after this life. And so basically, live it up. Eat, drink, and be merry. For tomorrow we die. That philosophy is, of course, still here. Hedonism is still here. Existentialism. You know, living for the pursuit of pleasure. In other words, the focus is me. It's all about me. And Paul also referred uh, to this in 1 Corinthians 15, uh, verse 32. He said, if the dead do not rise, of course, 1 Corinthians 15 is talking about the resurrection. If the dead do not rise, again, quote, let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. And he's quoting a, a Greek philosopher here. And so the resurrection would really impact this worldview, the Epicurean worldview, because there is life after death, praise God. And we know that, that it is eternal conscious torment in hell, or it is, praise God, eternal life with the Lord Jesus Christ. So then we have the Stoics. They were there too. These are the two predominant uh, philosophical groups. So the Stoics believe that there is no true God, but God is in all. And they were resigned to basically to whatever came. Oh well, that's life, you know, kind of like that. And they had a fatalistic view of life, and basically they thought you really shouldn't care much about anything anyway. It's very hopeless and a very joyless and a meaningless, really, worldview. And I notice that Paul didn't spend a lot of time here, it appears, from the text we have, in debating these philosophies. Doesn't mean he couldn't. But he knew, he was aware of them. Obviously he was. And he brought the truth of the gospel of Jesus to them. He was not trying to prove he was uh, an intellectual, like they said they were, uh, and could debate with them. He wanted them to hear the truth of the living, almighty creator the true and the only God. And we need to keep that as our focus also. You know, when we're talking to somebody, they may try to get us off into this or that. Let's, let's keep focused on the Lord Jesus. And I'll talk about that in just a minute. Some of the people here, from the, especially these two major philosophies, called Paul a babbler. Have you ever been called a babbler? I would take it as, that as a negative. And it says, and some said, what does this babbler want to say? I think they did want to know what he said, but their view of him wasn't too lofty. And so they ridicule, ridiculed him as someone who was a little bit crazy, you know, like with a scattered mind. In fact, the Greek word here means is related to scattering. And uh, sometimes it, used, it was used back then of a small little bird that just hopped around scattering seed. That's all it did, you know. So they're calling him, you know, in their pride uh, and in their so-called wisdom. They looked at Paul as really not making much sense and kind of contemptible. And we should know. Another way we should be ready is that we may be viewed this way. 
We will look foolish to some. We will, they might call us babblers or think of us in that way. So then in the second part of verse 18, it said, others, others said, he seems to be a proclaimer of foreign gods because he preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. Now, in this, the Greeks would have assumed that he was talking about two gods anyway because they were polytheistic. They looked at everything that way. They assumed there were 30,000 gods. And so they looked at it said, because he preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. Some commentaries believe that they, that they thought Jesus was on God and Anastasis, Anastasis was the other God, which is a Greek word for the resurrection. So Jesus and Anastasis, there was, you know, he's probably preaching to us about two more gods. Two more we can maybe include in our, in our pantheon about Paul, that he always played these two strings. It's an interesting way to put it. Jesus and the resurrection. And we would be wise to basically do the same thing. To preach Christ and him crucified and everlasting life in him alone. If that was all we said and we had a verse to share with that, that would be a wonderful way to present the gospel. Matthew Henry also said Paul's goal was to turn them from the service of idols and of Satan in them, he knew it was demonic, to the service of the true and living God in Christ. That was his goal here. Always was his goal. Verse 19, and they took him and brought him to the Oropagus saying, may we know what this new doctrine is of which you speak? For you are bringing some strange things to our ears, therefore we want to know what these things mean. And so they asked him to speak on Mars Hill, a place where people and leaders gathered. And they, they took him there, um, they brought him there, and you know, that's where they hung out. Some of them all the time. That's all they did was hang out there. And they were curious to hear what Paul was teaching. And I think sometimes if we are bolder, we will find people who are curious. Really? You think that way? Wow, I don't meet too many people that way. And we should think about that. It's okay to present that with the possibility that they will look at you as a babbler, that they'll say, wow, I, hmm, I haven't heard that. I'd like to hear more about that. Maybe so. And so they gave him public access, basically a lot of public access. The court was there also, as I mentioned, where it was decided, among other matters, what gods could be added to this 30,000 plus that they already had. They would make that decision there. The judges would. And so Paul would be heard, would, would have been heard by judges and also uh, by men of status there. And to many of them, it was like a hobby. This is just a hobby. A challenge to hear new ideas, to, to debate them. And they liked secrets. They liked to hear secrets. But Paul really wasn't talking about that here. He was wanting the truth of the living God to be known. It seemed that they had not been exposed maybe to the Old Testament or to uh, Jewish scriptures. Maybe they had, maybe they just rejected them. But if they had, they would have heard the truth that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. I'll refer to this again in just a minute. That the Lord God began the universe. And I think it's important, I'll mention again uh, in just a minute, that we should bring the truth of creation more, I believe, into the pres our presentation of the gospel. Anyway, uh, ver going on, verse 21. For all the Athenians and the foreigners who were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. Wow, what a life. I mean, how did they do that? I was, I, I was wondering, did they have a welfare state back then too? I, you know, how did they, they, just, uh, they sat there all the time just doing that. And I, I assume it's referring mostly to the wealthy who could do that. Now, one of my first thoughts, too, was uh, how the Internet is kind of the new uh, way to spend a lot of time telling people something or hearing something new. I'll just leave that there. Because <laughs> I'm from a different generation, and I think, uh, anyway, okay. They were interested. They were interested, praise God, in Paul's message. Because it was new. And they like to hear, they like to debate, they like to be mentally challenged with new philosophies. Really, with novelty. They love novelty, I guess. Uh, maybe what you would say, you could say novelty was their idol, one of them, anyway. They maybe wanted to add Paul's gods to the pantheon of their gods. 
And it appeared that being educated with so-called wisdom uh, also certainly was an idol to them. And their idol may have been idleness. One other place that Paul referred to that problem is in 1 Timothy 5, and he said, in verse 13, he said, some young, this is about younger widows at that time, and he said, they learned to be idle, wandering about from house to house, and not only idle, but also gossips and busybodies, saying things they ought not to say. So, idleness is still an idol in our land, I believe. So the Greeks and those who liked to hang around Mars Hills, they spent their time in nothing else, it says. They, in other words, were wasting their lives away. And it reminds me of being, again, too caught up in what is going on in the media. You, it is too possible to be too caught up on, on that. And, you know, where folks spend hours hearing and really never coming to a knowledge of the truth. And it reminded me of this morning... And I've only referred to this once this year, so here it is, the tw- second time, about the 10 questions to ask at the beginning of the year. And there's still some in the back there. One of them is, what is the single biggest time waster in your life, and what will you do about it this year? And indeed, if, if lack of time is actually uh, a hindrance for us sharing the gospel, we ought to think about that. We are stewards of our master's time. And since it is all his, and it is all for him, our time must be used wisely as he's commanded. And one of the major ways we are to use our time is in obedience to our commission to proclaim the gospel. Have you done a time analysis on that? I'm, I haven't done that. I'm not going to do that probably. But you know, some people analyze every bit of time and they know where everything went. But these people gathered on Mars Hill uh, became, in Romans 1, it says they became futile in their thoughts. So they're all gathered sharing their ignorance, basically, you know? And Romans 1 says they became futile in their thoughts and their foolish hearts were darkened. Two things going on there. They became futile in their thoughts, just worthless. And their foolish hearts were then darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. Many we meet and many we know have futile thoughts and they have darkened hearts. They need the gospel. People will try to sound wise, of course, when we speak to them. They'll try to sound really astute, really learned to get you off track. 1 Corinthians 1, though, says, where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer or the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. That pleases God, that the the so-called foolishness of the message, that's what they called it, was preached. It's preached by us. For Jews request a sign. They wanted miracles, And Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, and Paul is certainly doing that here. We preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block or an offense, and to the Greeks foolishness. That's what they said. This babbler is uttering foolishness. But to those who are called, those who are chosen, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. But in hearing Paul, they were encountering the absolute truth of the living God, their creator here. Many of them for the first time. They needed not uh, just to converse, just to debate, just to tickle their ears. They didn't need just that. That's what they liked to do. But they needed to hear the scriptures. The people around us need to hear the word of God. And all those with futile thinking And all those with darkened hearts need to hear the gospel of the living God and of our Lord Jesus Christ. They have no hope outside of their futility and their darkness. So we need to be ready, dear family. We need to be ready to be prepared to bring the truth of the gospel in Jesus to those bound by idolatry. And I had a thought on this just as I was reading it this the other day. Maybe we should call this year the year of readiness. This is the year of readiness. May the Lord make us ready in a way we've never been before to be proclaiming the gospel with boldness, with skill, with joy. 
And may this year be helpful in this, and may we move ahead in a substantive way in always being ready with the good news, every single one of us. And that it would be our mindset. We wouldn't wake up and not think something like, I'm going to Walmart right now, Lord, prepare the way for me. Help me to bump into somebody. Help me to say something to somebody. Help somebody to say something to me. So we should be ready with the good news. And may we have that kind of mindset. And then take those opportunities that the Lord certainly will give us if we ask him. Going on, verses 22 through 31, this is the presentation is between verses 22 and 31, the, his evangelist, evangelistic presentation. And what can we learn from his address to these people on Mars Hill? Well, he introduces his message <clears throat> In verses 22 and 23, then Paul stood in the midst of the Oropagus, they'd put him right in there, everybody's sitting around listening to him, and said, men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. Just threw that out there, I bet that really got their attention. For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing him I proclaim to you. Now I believe how we also speak to a group or any individual, how we begin speaking to them uh, is very important. And it sets the tone and uh, impacts the openness of their hearing possibly. Paul was showing here that he cared enough to have observed their beliefs and that I think, made it much more likely that they would listen to him. He was tactful. He was winsome. He did not needlessly offend his hearers to get their attention. Didn't need to. He perceived, and he was aware, and so he acknowledged that they were a religious people. Now that word, it turns out, that Greek word can be looked at in two ways. In most translations said, uh, he said, you are, I see that you are very religious. It can also be taken on the negative side that you are too superstitious. That was true, but this is how it's translated. I believe this is in the context. He, he, was, he was not being uh, obnoxious. He said, you are a very religious people. And they would have probably just nodded their heads. Yeah, we are. Everyone is religious, right? In that they trust in, they have faith in something or someone. So don't let the secular word tell you otherwise. They're all religious. Cornelius Van Til said this, culture is religion externalized. You've all heard that one before, I think. Look at the prevailing culture in the U.S. Its religion is externalized even more overtly, I think, uh, in the culture of selfishness all around us, culture of pride. And being homeschoolers doesn't mean we shouldn't be wise as serpents and innocent as of doves. You know, we should be aware of the decadent culture around us, but certainly not of it, like John 17, like we know in John 17, the Lord told us, we don't have to be of it to be able to speak against it or to gain a hearing from those in it. And Paul knew that the people of Mars Hills were in some way uh, a people uh, groping. They use the word grope here. They were groping for hope. They were groping for meaning and for peace. They were looking for something, obviously. They spent nothing but talking about all those things. But without the truth of the word of God, they would just keep stumbling in their search. Everyone will. And we must realize that. These people around us will continue stumbling. It doesn't mean we will see their conversion, but if they're in our lives, there's certainly a possibility for us to proclaim the gospel too. So they're stumbling around, they're stumbling to the death, and we should be ready to speak to those who are groping for the truth. And we don't maybe know who those are, but God does, and he's called us to speak. Speak the words of hope and life to them. So Paul got their attention by his observation here that they have an idol to an unknown God. But he was ready. When he saw that, he was ready to use that as a means of communication and as a way to present the truth. So they had this idol that he saw. It was likely a pillar because they wanted, so they wanted to make sure they had every God possible there. They wanted to make sure that they'd covered their bases well, we have 30,000 plus, but you never know, we might have missed one. And so, you know, they just put that there. And, you know, 
Paul here, though, this was a spirit-led way for Paul to transition to proclaiming the only true God, which would have knocked some of them backwards. That would have been a shock. So he, he was transitioning that way. I pray that we can grow in that skill and that ability. I believe we can. And we should pray that the Holy Spirit would guide us to begin conversations in a way that will open doors, in a winsome way, and that will lead toward a hearing of the truth of the gospel. Even if it's brief, that we'll get a chance to share or to leave something. And we should ask the Lord before we speak to open our eyes to how we can begin. You know, how can I be compassionate? How can I be engaging? Like I mentioned, before going shopping, before really going anywhere, Lord, enable me to talk to someone. And in some cases, you may not have a lot of transition time to pray. You may just pray in your heart, and the Lord knows. But we should trust in God's sovereignty to use whatever we are able to share in, in his, uh, by his leading. And we should never treat people as a project or evangelism as a project. People will know if we're treating them in that way. Certainly they will. So, people who need the hope of the gospel. Again, we may plant, right? We may plant the seed. I mean, maybe some others planted it too in the process of this person's uh, turning to the Lord. Uh, we may plant. Others may water. But God gives the growth. And he opens eyes. He's the one who does that. He uses us, praise God. So let's pray to be observant. Let's pray to be observant like Paul and to gain a hearing as much as possible uh, to the people we speak with, with meekness and with gentleness, according to 1 Peter 3, 15. So Paul began where they were, right? He began where they were, not using religious terms that they did not know. And he could have done that. He could have blown them away. Uh, easily. And, and he, in the synagogue, he would have used words that would have been uh, unknowable to them. And he would have used, he could have talked about sin and righteousness and judgment and uh, the Messiah and you know, all those. But uh, he, he knew he couldn't do that here, at least in the beginning. But he was establishing a connection with them. And sometimes I think, brothers and sisters, we need to kind of rethink our vocabulary and just make sure that we are actually communicating in a way that these dear people can understand. And it takes a while to think that way. In Japan, when I first went to Japan, uh, I was told, okay, you can't use the word sin and you can't use those words unless you explain it all. And that was a challenge in that I was speaking in broken Japanese. They, or English wasn't so great. I mean, we were already challenged here. Um, so I had to really think about how would you explain sin in that situation? Well, I had to try. And it was, took me a lot of words, a lot of broken Japanese, but I couldn't just use the word sin. I didn't cut it at all. And even after explaining it for a long time, they still look at, you know, quizzical. So part of our readiness to share with anyone, uh, meaning strangers for one time, for example, or family members for the rest of our lives, is to think ahead. You know, prepare. We, we can prepare every time, we, every day for this. We can pray ahead. Lord, open doors. And then communicate so that we have uh, few, they have fewer hindrances to understanding the basics of the gospel. We should have a, a holy burden to share this in this way. A holy burden so that, yes, we'll take the effort to uh, reduce our vocabulary, for example. And then Paul, in his presentation that follows, spoke uh, of who the true God is, of course. He was leading to that. And of this response that would bring them the truth. Truth that would satisfy the hungry, those who were hungry, and the longing uh, for those who were prepared by the Holy Spirit and called by God. So Paul connected with them by saying that the one you worship, you, you have that pillar there, the one you worship, who you call the unknown God, the one you realize you don't know, or maybe you left him out, him I proclaim to you. And again, I'm sure that really opened their ears. I mean, they were ready to hear. And he begins to proclaim who their creator is. They don't acknowledge him, but he is their creator, who is the true and living God. And he will end then, we'll notice, by proclaiming that what they should do. He will tell them things to do. It's okay for us to do that too. But lovingly, of course. Verses 24 and 25, he goes on now to say, this is the real God. 
Those are all small g gods. This is the almighty God. God who made the world and everything in it since he is Lord of heaven and earth. He just said that out there as the truth. Since he is. He wasn't going to debate about it. Does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, since he, he gives all life, breath, and all things. So Paul begins clearly and boldly with foundational truths here in bringing the gospel, as we should, to anyone. He was aware of the culture around him, as we've mentioned, and he spoke boldly, and he spoke wisely against idolatry. He had to, right? And we must be aware of the culture around us, even the culture of that person, in a sense if you know them, and of those with whom we are speaking, as much as we can. It, it is incumbent on us to learn what are their idols, what are their fears, problems, all of those things. And in some way, we are, too, are also to tell of the God of creation, of the world and all that is in it. He created the world and all that is in it, including them. He is the Lord of heaven and earth. He is Lord and master. And he rightly claims it all and that person as his. Now, all of this, again, probably got their attention. It might have even shocked them. But I think they really were listening at this point. Ken Ham wrote a book. It's called The Gospel Reset. It's up here if you want to look at it later. Gospel Reset. In which he points out that uh, in Acts 2, the apostle Peter could share with Jews, as Paul did when he went into a, a city, he could share with the Jews from a biblical understanding using their terminology of creation and of a creator. They would have understood that and he would have gone from there. But here in Acts 17, Paul was speaking to Greeks who did not have uh, that foundational knowledge about creation, about sin, about salvation. And uh, he points out that here in America, we are now in an Acts 17 situation. And we have to be aware of that as we share the gospel. We can't just take, just do as we used to do. For, well, or I used to do, maybe. Us older folks used to do. For example, in, 19, in the 19, early 70s, in the dormitories, I could go around, and we did all the time, and talk to people. And I knew I could use this, a lot of this terminology. I'd do the bridge illustration, sin, and the salvation. and they, they knew that. They didn't, a lot of them didn't doubt it. They didn't believe it, maybe. But they knew who. God was. They knew they were sinners. Many of them would say that. Uh, they knew who Jesus was, some. Uh, but we can't assume that now. I don't assume that now. Ken Ham believes that we need to go back to Genesis. Be begin there more often in our presentations of the gospel. Because many now do not understand the truth of Genesis, of creation. And really, to start there, uh, it, it makes sense, makes logical sense. Uh, we can talk about the origin of sin and death. And then the need of salvation, of course. Now, Will Metzger, in another book I have up here, it's called To Tell the, Tell the Truth. I highly recommend this book. I'd love to study it with someone. Um, it's a training manual on the message and methods of God-centered witnessing. Tell the Truth by Will Metzger. The whole gospel to the whole person by whole people. So in that book, he said, the erosion in the Western world of the creator-creature distinction which is foundational to all biblical thought, constitutes a serious challenge to evangelism. I believe that's true. And so we need to think about that. How does that change maybe the way we present the gospel? It's, he called it a serious challenge to evangelism. So in the appendix of that book, in the, of this little book, Ken said uh, he had a brief way uh, to share using Genesis. Uh, and he called it the Genesis Road and the Roman Road. I thought that was kind of, the Roman Road, many people know, uh, as a, a means to share the gospel. You go through five or six verses from, Gen, uh, from Romans in a very logical fashion, and it lays out the gospel very well, the Romans road. And if you have your Bible open, uh, back then we didn't, couldn't show them a phone, but you know we could just go straight through, flip the page, and go through the Roman road. So he has the Genesis road and the Roman road. Genesis 1, uh, 1 of course, says God made everything. Start there. Genesis 1.31 says God made everything perfectly. So in other words, there's no uh, death and suffering. And then their sin uh, came. And then Genesis 1.31, God made everything perfectly. Uh, there was no death and suffering. Um, or and then, I'm sorry, the punishment for sin and death. And then, then he would also do the Roman road. So maybe he'd use three verses from uh, the Genesis road, all pointing to Jesus, by the way, and then the Roman road. Romans 5.12, of course, 
we uh, all now sin like Adam, Romans 3.23. Uh, you know, we are all sinners. And then Romans 10.9, we must repent and we must turn to Christ as our Savior and Lord, which he, he will do, Paul will do here. So we may need to go back to the beginning, in other words, to the book of beginnings, and then uh, to the moral law also to help people see their need of the gospel. Well, Paul went on to explain that the almighty creator God does not need a physical building, of course, to live in. He made the hands that built the buildings. And he's not limited, and he's not bound. He needs nothing. Many people don't like a God they can't define in our country, or they can't, uh, they don't, who doesn't need them, whom they can't use for their own purposes. Even many Christians need to be reminded of God's aseity, that he is self-existent and he is self-sufficient. He needs nothing. The true God who needs nothing gives to all people life and breath and everything. So we need to remind ourselves of this too and then help others understand that God gave them life, gives them breath. And it's imp it was important for Paul to be clear to them about this because they had all these buildings around and all these gods made by hands created by them to appease false gods. And I was going to quote some verses from Isaiah 40 here. You can go to Isaiah 40. Uh, it describes very well the foolishness of man taking a piece of wood and carving something and saying, this is my God. And then it goes on in Isaiah 40 of saying how the true God should be worshipped. So Paul had to address that. He, he, he didn't avoid confronting idolatry. He couldn't avoid it. And so he did it directly. And I believe he did it simply. This is another main point. Uh, again, in this book, Tell the Truth, Will Metzger said, anyone who makes the gospel sophisticated and abstract is not making a New Testament proclamation, but is trusting in human understanding and in his own wisdom. May it not be so here. In my prayer, according to 1 Corinthians 2, verses 4 and 5, may our speech and our preaching not be with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power that their faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Going on, verses 26 through 28, he starts addressing a little bit more of, well, what is man then? You know, who, who is God, what is God, and what is man? And he goes on, and he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of, and their, of their dwellings, so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as also some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Now you may not notice here, it's not all in quotes, but there are three quotes from Greek philosophers in a row there. He is not far from each one of us. That's one. For in him we live and move and have our being. That's two. For we are also his offspring. That's three. Paul was aware. He was sharp. He knew how to uh, have an open door, a more open door. Because they would have known all of these Greek philosophers. So Paul is exalting the true creator as the creator of man. He, he really had to start there. And then of uh, all the nations of people. And he made us all of one nature in his image, all of us of Adam, all of us of Noah. Paul was in this showing a connection between him and them, right? You know, I'm, I was made too. I was created, you were created by this creator God. And that God has a purpose and a plan for all people and all nations. In other words, Paul was communicating that the God who created all is sovereign over all things in all times. They may not have understand that word, understood that word, whatever it was in Greek. We may not be able to use that word either, but we can communicate that. That's the God I worship. That's the God I believe and the God I'm telling you about. God who controls all things and he needs nothing. So here Paul was beginning, uh, again, helping people who believed in many gods to want to seek the true God, helping those who in hope were groping for him. It's kind of like, you know, you can picture this, it's feeling around, somebody's really looking for somebody in a room, for example, and it's pitch black, and he's groping. He wants to find this person. He really wants to. He'll, he's stumbling over everything. And we should know that there are many around us, dear family, who are stumbling around like this. You know, they may not look like it on the surface. They might try to fool us. 
But they are stumbling if they don't know the gospel. You can know that for sure. But they're stumbling around. Some are going to be more overt. Say, I need help. I need the gospel. No, they wouldn't say that maybe, but I need help. I need hope. And this is what God wants, those who seek him. Last week we looked at Proverbs 8. I love those who love me and those who seek me diligently will find me. And he wants us to share the light so that they can do that. Certainly it's all of his grace and for his glory, but he uses us. And hard times and stressful times like we're living in cause people, I believe, to seek the Lord. This time, this age that we are living in, uh, even the last two years that the Lord has made us to be a part of, are times that many people then are looking for hope or any kind of stability. It's a great time for us to reach out. Many are fearful and many are hopeless. Again, they may, they may look on the outside like they got it all together. May the Lord send us to share with those who are seeking him, who are groping for him as he determined that we might have the joy of serving him in this way and being a part of bringing the truth of Jesus to those that he has prepared, that he has pre-appointed. And I think it is something also for us to consider when we share with others to uh, speak of the nearness of God, the nearness of God. Why? Maybe they don't believe that there's a God to be near, but we should speak of it, that he is not far from any of us, like Paul used here. He is imminent. He is close. He is omnipresent. And he has revealed himself to be known. And he is knowable by his spirit. Praise God. And he sent his son to make knowing him possible. People need to know that their creator can be known. That they can commune with him. I mean, what, what, there's, the best cure for loneliness is to know Jesus. They can be lonely in a crowd. They can be lonely with their friends. But not in communion, true communion with Jesus. And as Paul began above, God is also transcendent. He's the creator God. He's holy. He's far beyond our comprehension. And both of these are important to try to explain at some point anyway as we share the gospel. People need to learn of the holiness of God. They must, in contrast to their sinfulness. And that he made a way to know him through the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus. To remove the just penalty upon all of us for our sin and our rebellion against his law. We have a few tracks in the office, and we need to get some more. That's another uh, aspect of the, uh, the group that I mentioned earlier in the beginning. We're looking at tracks. We're trying to find some and make them available. And then on March 19th, that's tentative, we, we're going to have a mini conference here, uh, maybe just a few hours, uh, where we will learn how to be effective, maybe using those tracks. Certainly, we'll always pray. And we have some other things in mind. So you can mark that down. Verse 28, for in him we live and move and have our being, as also some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Those are two Greek philosophers there. So he quoted these, and that was another way to establish a connection with them. He wanted, I think, them to understand that he really cared about them, enough to know this is what they believed, this is what they all read, and this is what they all studied. And Paul used that to point them then to the true God, the God of all creation. And he wasn't here affirming the philosopher, but he was using some, some that, that he could speak to them. People need to know that God is the author of life, of their life, and he enables them to carry out life, and that they have being. They exist at all because of him. They are not a random chance. So yes, we probably will be uh, speaking about evolution at some point, against it, of course. Well, after declaring who God is and who man is, Paul concludes with actions that they should take, verses 29 through 31. So basically, repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. That's what conversion is. You repent, people repent, must turn from that to Jesus Christ by faith, which is a gift. Verse 29, therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art and man's devising. Truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man, the Lord Jesus, whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him 
from the dead. Again, they were probably shocked. Paul speaks of what he just said here and what follows here. Uh, he spoke it as being completely and unalterably true. He said, therefore, since we are, again, since it is true, this is the truth. And that there are consequences for their idolatry. He presupposes that God's word is truth, and so should we. We must, as we share the word of God. With no doubts, even if people respond with anger or scorn, they hate the word of God, well, and they're likely, we should, another way of being ready, we must know that they will t attack the veracity of God's word, because that is our foundation, once they realize that. Paul is saying that because the true God is our creator, that those listening to him who are made in his image should not continue in idolatry. You should, just should not do that. And he's saying this. Remember where he's saying this. There are 30,000 idols around him. He's saying, you shouldn't do this. His divine nature, he said, cannot be represented by idols. The true and living God, you can't represent him in this way. They should not continue to think that they can take things that God has made to make their own God, a God of their own imagination. And that's their darkness. They're walking in darkness. And Paul then told them that, uh, very boldly again that God is overlooked, that God has shown patience in withholding judgment for their idolatry. Romans 120, uh, Romans 120 says, uh, regarding his general revelation, that they are without excuse. They are still without excuse. But that God is the almighty judge, and he has commanded repentance for sin, the sin of idolatry, sorrow for sin, and forsaking of this. And they're all guilty, and they must repent. Yes, we can do that lovingly, but they must know that that is the truth. We are all guilty. And that is part of what we need to share also. It says right here, he commands all men everywhere to repent. How can we not say that also? So the Epicureans and the Stoics and many others probably started to get a little more heated here, uh, except those maybe who are cut to the heart who already at that point, to, uh, to hear that God has set a day of judgment and that he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. So God picked a man. He ordained him, and he will judge the world. They will be judged. That they should have begun thinking. They will be judged according to uh, his righteous standards and by his representative, the Lord Jesus. He now tells them of the only Savior, the only one who can take their judgment for their idolatry. Certainly in a gospel presentation, that's kind of where we want to get to. And our Lord said this, we looked at this two weeks ago in Luke 24, one of the five key verses on the, uh, that the Lord gave us um, in our commission. It was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. It's exactly what Paul's doing here. He's carrying that out here. He's preaching repentance and remission of sins beginning at, outside of, to, to the nations. To conclude, verses 32 through 34, the results of his evangelism. So he preached. He did so wisely. God led him to observe, and he did it simply. It says, when they heard of the resurrection, though, of the dead, some mocked, while others said, we will hear you again on this matter. And so Paul departed from among them, However, some men joined him and believed, among them Dionysius the Areopagite, a woman named Amorous, and others with them. So it looks like not a huge response. Not like Thessalonica, not like Berea, which he got ran out of. Some mocked Paul. Certainly, that didn't bother him too much. Paul got a lot more than mocking. He'd experienced a lot more, a lot worse. And again, I, I believe we will be mocked, we will be ridiculed. We could be rejected. We might be ignored. That might be even more painful or, or even hated. As we saw in John 17, the world will hate us. But that should not deter us, dear family. May it not. That should not hinder us or make us fearful to speak. Some will mock us and reject the Lord, but some will want to hear. Praise God. Some, are, some do want to hear right around us now. 
And for those with whom we have the possibility of future contact, we should plan to continue to bring the word to them in some way and to continue to be a light. Their seeming disinterest doesn't mean that our part of our commission uh, to them has ended. We shouldn't give up easily. We may have to take the initiative, yes, and not wait for them to approach us, but lovingly keep telling them of the living God and of salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't have to be pushy, of course, or belligerent or too strong, but we should be persistent. We should be persistent, like we are called to be in prayer also. So Paul departed this place, it says. As far as we know, he left Athens. He, he left a kind of a beachhead there uh, for the growth of the church. And uh, as far as we know, he never came back personally. He did not write a letter uh, to them that's in the canon uh, that, or that even ex- ex- exists. But it says Dionysius the Oropagite and a woman named Dam- Damaris and others with them. So again, it isn't the multitude that was in the previous places. So Dionysius likely was a magistrate. He was a judge. And according to, to tradition, he became the bishop of Athens. Damaris may not have been, even been on Mars. There's mostly men there. Uh, but she may have been converted uh, in Athens while Paul was in Athens. And we do not have a letter written by Paul, like I mentioned, to the church in Athens. So this may have not been a large group during his time. When he departed, there's a handful there, maybe may more. But God brought some to himself through his sermon. I don't think Paul was counting. I mean, sure, he would, would have loved multitudes, but the seed he sowed yielded fruit. And the Lord can use our outreach for the growth of his church. And let's pray. Let's pray that we will be fruitful and that we would sow the seed and water and see him bring people into the kingdom. We also must trust that the word that we have spoken, as weakly as me, we may feel it was done, that that word, that truth that we have shared by the grace of God will glorify the Lord. It will please him because we have been obedient to carry out our part of the commission, as small as that may seem. I've told it before. One time in sharing in the dorms, I shared everything backwards. I shared the bridge illustration and man was holy and God was sinful. You know, I just messed up the whole thing. But this person said it made sense to him. And God used that. Okay? And so he will use our heart of obedience to reach people. Praise God. You don't have to be eloquent. You don't have to have a ton of verses memorized. A few is great. So we can trust him with the results and not feel that we have failed if what we thought uh, should happen, would happen, didn't happen. So to conclude, after his witness, a few people joined Paul and believed, it says. Let's pray diligently that from this year forward, in other words, not just this year, that this would be happening here in this church, that people would come to the Lord and become part of his kingdom, part of his church, because he has moved us to be fruitful, to speak, because we have accepted our commission and have acted in faith, and we have spoken as he leads. Soli Deo Gloria, To God alone be the glory. Let's pray. Oh Lord, we are your people and we are in awe that you would call us and commission us to carry the truth of the gospel in Jesus Christ to other people. Lord, we desire to be faithful in this and we thank you for the power of your precious word which we speak and the power of your Holy Spirit who empowers us to speak and who opens the eyes and hearts of those you have chosen, who are groping for you. Lord, may we go forth as your witnesses with boldness and with compassion and with obedient hearts. Oh Lord, establish the work of our hands, we pray, as we serve in your kingdom, as stewards of your precious word and the treasure of the gospel. For we ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. Amen.